All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another Kennel Metal webinar. Uh, Steve George and Danny Davis with you again today. Hey guys. And uh, we hope everybody out there is uh, being safe and doing well. So we we really enjoy uh, getting to share some some of these topics with all of you. And uh, yeah, I hope this is nice and informative for people today. Uh, before we get started, and, and just to kind of go over our topic, this is the second part of our chip thinning topic that we're talking about. So today we're going to get into more uh, coloring, surfacing, high feed cutters, things like that. Um, and uh, please feel free that, you know, if you've got questions, so if you're on the click meeting, that lower right hand corner, feel free to type something in there. If you're watching this uh, live on Facebook or later on Facebook, uh, please feel free to type us in a comment. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, you can put a question down there, give us a like. Uh, if you like this video and if you're watching it later on YouTube, and we know some people are, uh, please feel free, you know, give us a, a comment down there. Uh, like the video. You can subscribe also to Kenna Metal's uh, Facebook um, and to the YouTube channel and get updates. So, yeah, we'll try to respond to all those comments as, as much as we can. Absolutely. So, um, you know, with that said, let's talk a little bit about what our, what our topic is today. Um, and to kind of get started, let's talk about, we, we put Kellering on the title. So we want to talk a little bit about what we actually mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other terms for that? So the first topic that we're going to touch on, so we could call it, um, we could call it Kellering. We could call it 3D surfacing. We could call it uh, contour profile milling. Um, basically, you know, what we're going to discuss is if we have some object, some surface in space that we want to machine, and it's basically a 3D type shape, yep. um, you know, how we go in with a profile tool and basically with a, with a tangent tool, tangent surface relationship, make that cut. Yeah, I think about this, you know, like airfoils or uh, list milling yep. or uh, dye mold, dye mold, yep. um, impellers. There's a lot of a lot of 3D surfacing or coloring type operations out there, and we just want to talk about how to maximize uh, the tools for those type of operations. Absolutely. I mean, we get a lot of questions about it, so we want to try to get as much knowledge as we can out there. Um, so, just real quick, this this term coloring, because it may be different for different people in parts of the world, and we really appreciate that we have a very international audience uh, mm -hmm. on here and in general. So kind of in the U.S., coloring gets used a lot. Where it goes back to is, um, let's say, before CNC, if you wanted to make a contoured part, uh, there were these tracing milling machines. So usually you would have a model of the part that you wanted to make, okay, and you'd have a head that basically would take a stylus that was the same shape as your tool, tracing the model and duplicating it over on the side of the of the actual spindle, which right. is which is kind of neat, you know, to think about it. One of the most uh, common machines for that was from a machine company called Keller, and the name kind of stuck. So Pratt and Whitney bought that company, I think, in the 30s, and um, so we see it a lot, especially in, in airspace. But that's what we mean. We yeah, I don't know if they still do it today, but I know I've seen some videos where they where they make coins. Mm -hmm. And when, are, when they, they do a model that has somebody that does uh, sculpting right. to do the model for the coin, and then they color it, like top mm -hmm. model, basically, which, which we're talking about. And, today. of course, modern version, I guess you could do that, 3D scan it, yep. run it through CAM. So, But, of course, the big advantage we have now is that we can control all those paths, you know, kind of to the nth degree. So what type of tool do you want to use? How do you want to program that path? How do you want to control feed and speed independently? And that's a lot of what we want to talk about today. So, Danny, let's let's get started with some of our little topics that we have here. Um, why don't we discuss a little bit about surface finish? Right. So let me pull up our um, presentation that we have. And what I think a couple things we need to talk about is what's actually controlling the surface finish mm -hmm. on the when we're in the coloring or surface milling operation. You know, what do we want to do to to make that surface as smooth as possible, and so we're not benching it afterwards. And when we use the term benching, we're talking about any kind of hand operation that has to be done after the CNC milling. You know, obviously we want to minimize that as much as possible or eliminate it if possible. Uh, so we want to get that finish as the 
best we can. And, and, and depending on what the part requirements are, some of them may not need that great of a fit. It's right. Uh, you know, in those situations, like I think about the medical field for knee replacements or hip replacements, you know, they really want a nice, smooth surface on that part. And, you know, what controls that? And we see here in this drawing that we have is, is the cusp pipe and how much we step over that cutter and also the radius of the cutter. You know, obviously we can, we can make that radius larger if the part uh, allows. Uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, tooling up for a part, you know, we want to look at the part to see what the features are on it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the, the radius on the cutter cannot be larger than the minimum radius on the part. Okay, otherwise you'll never be able to uh, to to make that surface. So we want to look at that and maximize that radius as much as possible because that will allow us to step over it, uh, uh, more and reduce our number of passes. Uh, but we want to minimize that cusp pipe. Now, depending on your part um, tolerances mm -hmm. on the surface finish, uh, would be determine what we want to do for that cusp pipe. And as right. like I said, for something like a knee replacement or a hip replacement. Um, you know, we see that those those cusp heights have to be well below one tenth of an inch. Uh, so, that, you know, for other parts that that that, uh, that are not so tight in the surface finish, we can mm -hmm. maybe step over and have a cusp height of one inch. And just making that small change, you know, just a few tenths can make a huge difference in the amount of step over that we have. It, it can, Danny. I think what I'm going to do, I'm just real quick i'm going to switch to our detail camera just okay. for a minute and we'll yeah, go back so just a second everybody the screen will go blank for just a second as we switch cameras but we will be right back all right so the reason i wanted to do that is uh as usual we 3d printed a few little little toys for show and tell today so the part that we have here basically is set to match the radius from this ball nose tool. So you'll see that maybe a few times today as we go in. But if you kind of look at, you know, again, just matching up to the drawing that Danny showed, you know, cusp height is the depth, okay, from the bottom here to the top of these peaks. So you can see already the step over from the center of this to here, okay, is mathematically going to set this height if we started to have a bigger step over, so with these overlapping out in the space, you can see if we were really moving that cutter over, how much higher mm -hmm. that immediately gets. So this is one of the biggest things, obviously, just to have in the back of your mind as we talk through this. And keep in mind that you can have multiple step overs in the same part. So if you're thinking about finishing of that part later, maybe there's some areas that are really hard for you to get into finish. Maybe you want a, a tighter step over, right? You know, to have a smaller cusp bite in those, and maybe other areas that are easier for you to belt, sand, polish, however you want to do it. Um, you can be more efficient with your pass and space it out a little bit. So, all right, I'm going to go back to the regular camera. All right, and when we're when we're doing this type of coloring or, or surface milling that we're talking about, you know, I know we talked a little bit up about this in our last webinar. But I think it's really key for us to bring it up today because it's very important that we consider chip thinning. Yes. Um, you know, I, I don't think chip thinning comes into uh, or has, is it as important in other operations as it is this because we have both radial and axial chip thinning. And sometimes it's a little bit hard for us to wrap it around in our brain exactly what's going on in, in this. But you, you, you know, most people consider the axial portion of it mm -hmm. um, as far as the feeding forward but they don't take into consideration the radial part of it. And I, I know we've got a slide here that we can bring up. I'll bring back up our presentation. And if I go to this slide here, yeah, this shows if you were looking on the left-hand side, and I'm going to get my pointer here where it work, Steve. Okay. Just a second. So while you're pulling it up, just to, just to remember that we defined, you know, before, mm -hmm. let me get my bigger core five model here. We'll get so done. again, you know, when we talk axial, we're talking right down the axis of the tool. Mm -hmm. So in that direction, and when we're talking radial, we're meaning perpendicular to that axis exactly. from the side. So that's axial and radial. Right. So maybe you can show that model too while, we're, while I'm showing this presentation. Okay. And that way we can kind of put them together because this sketch is just a it's just a simple sketch. Mm -hmm. but if you look to the to the left, this will be the the radial chip thinning. So it's just like Steve has with the model. So this you know if we have a step over.
but it's less than 50% of the diameter, which we would obviously right. with, with a coloring operation, um, then we've got to take into consideration of that the chip is going to be thinner than what we have programmed, the mm -hmm. theoretical chip, which is what we talked about last time. But if you look to the right, because this is a ball nose shape, and we're feeding, uh, we have a ball nose, ball nose shape on the, on the bottom, we're actually thinner because we're not up to the diameter of the ball or to the, to the top of the ball radius. Correct. So anything below the ball radius, we have chip thinning in that area too. So mm -hmm. it's very important for us to calculate when we're doing our speeds and feeds to allow for both the chip thinning in the axial direction and also the radial direction to maximize our uh, performance. And I have a, um, another slide that we'll show in a little bit about how uh, that basically helps us out with maximizing our cube catches and material mm -hmm. being removed. All right, and another thing too, if we don't do this, is that you know if we don't compensate for the chip thinning, we can actually have the chip so thin that we end up smearing the chip. And I see this a lot in uh, in operations that, that our customers that they'll not compensate for the chip thinning, and then they'll get a poor part finish. Right. Well, the part Especially finish, really ductile material. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Ductile material. So they'll they'll start bit, uh, making their step over less because they think that's what the reason is for their poor service finish, but really, in reality, the poor um, part finishes because we're not feeding it properly. Correct. Yep. So we need to make sure that we feed it properly so we end up getting the correct uh, finish on the part. Um, now, another thing that we think was, is good for us to talk about, Steve, and I think you can maybe show it with the models, is forward tilt mm -hmm. with the ball nose. I know we talked a little bit about with corner radius end mills, and we'll show that here in a little bit, but on a, on a ball nose end mill, it's very important for us to tilt it, and I think it's really good for us to illustrate why. So I'll let you show the model first, and then I'll show uh, what we have on our slides. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm just going to switch cameras again for a second, everybody. Give us a second, and we'll be right back. All right, super. So yeah, let's let's get into this a, a little bit. So with our with our ball nose here, so. One of the areas that we kind of want to start this conversation is talking about the center of the tool. Okay, so let me get it in here a little tighter. So once we go past a two flute tool, then we start to get into as we add flutes. All right, we need to have some some relief space right here. If we try to run all of these things to center, sorry, just trying to get this to focus here. If we try to run all of these teeth to center, what we're going to have is we're going to have a problem where we're not able to create any depth at all um, in these gashes. And if we don't have any depth, then definitely you're going to get problems with smearing. Right. You're going to have chip packing. Uh, life's just, just going to be rough. So, you know, one of the first things is to understand is that when we start to add multiple flutes, we're going to have usually some sort of notch or something there, and we're gonna have a space to the other flutes. So we need to think about that in trying to get the most flutes possible engaged, right? The other big thing that, you know, that's, that should be pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't think about it, is that, um, you know, we take this axis through the center, right? So when we think about speed, you know, we spin this tool at RPM, at a, at a, right. at a, rebel, a certain RPM, but, you know, the actual speed is changing with the radial distance. So when we get to the very center, it doesn't matter how fast we spin this thing, right? We have a zero speed condition in the very center. The farther we get away from that, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's another reason why we would like to make the contact point further out. Yep. And then one of the last things, so we talked about engaging all the teeth, but the other thing is you know the further we get away from the center the more efficient this overall cutting geometry becomes the flutes deeper or the gash is deeper the gash is closer to working into the flute it's just a whole lot easier for chip evacuation so when we start talking about tilt i'll just use this the back side of this as an as an example you know if we come straight down on it you know, we're, we've got that zero speed condition. We, we're not engaging all the cutting edges. But if we just start to tilt this, okay, now we're getting to a position 
So I've tilted it to there, mm -hmm. all right? So I'm just gonna set this down and let's look at where there is for a second. You know, if, if I trace that around, I'm gonna see that I would be able to cover um, all four edges very effectively. I've got good depth um, just by tilting that tool away from the center. Yeah, I think it's if you put it back up there, Steve. Okay. Well, you just had it with the with the uh, the base at the bottom, mm -hmm. and orient the tool where you can see the, the non center cutting clues. Okay. I can see it when you first put it up there, and that's a good illustration. I raised it up just a little bit. All right, that's a really good illustration showing that if you do not have forward tilt at that at that point, you only have two flutes effective. Yep. Not to mention the zero surface finish like you've already talked about, and all the other conditions. Right. But if we want to engage those other four, uh, other two teeth, or other three, uh, four teeth, mm -hmm. six fluidium mill, we have to tilt it enough to where we can get it on all of those. And I've got a, uh, a diagram on our uh, presentation I'll okay. show that shows we'll, that we'll as well. We'll keep it on the so tight camera that, for a uh, second. Uh, give me a second. So this is not really a good picture, but hopefully you guys can see it. Uh, down here at the bottom, um, yeah, let me get my, where you can see my pointer. Yeah, it's already on there. Okay, so uh, you see, like Steve showed, you know, we have two flutes cutting the center. Uh, this is a, happens to be a six flute end mill, and you see there's two circles. Well, the reason for the first circle is it's basically showing the distance from center line till we get that second set of flutes mm -hmm. engaged. Uh, and then there's another circle because the, the way the gashing is on the center cutting flutes, the, the, these sets of flutes, which we would call flute three and six, uh, are a little bit further out. So that this outer circle represents how much we'd have to tilt to get that. So if you look at the top, we have uh, zero degrees, which would have just the two center cutting flutes engaged. Right. And up to 15 degrees. Well, when we get to 15 degrees tilt, um, this happens to be for our um, Harvey three tapered ball nose. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the Harvey three tapered ball nose, when we get to 15 degrees till, we, we end up engaging two additional flutes, which will have um, four, and then we'll go uh, to 17 degrees or greater, and that's when we actually get all six flutes engaged. So if we don't know that when we're programming right. and we don't position the tool properly, you know, we're not utilizing the tool properly. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not using it to its full, fullest potential. You're, you're absolutely right, Dan. So let's let's talk real quick about the different different axes of the machine, real, and then we'll go back to the other camera. Okay. So just while I'm still in this view, um, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about this, we're talking about a four or five axis machine. However, if you have a three axis machine, and one your parts got to allow it, but if you're smart with your fixturing. You can do this in in other ways so you can think about how you position your part in your fixture so if you build a fixture or if you just simply take a, an angled vice a tilting vice set it exactly. to a certain angle you know even if i just wanted to machine something as simple as this so we do this a lot of times you know we've got four and five axes axis machines to test with we've also got a lot of three axis machines and you know sometimes we'll just do something as simple as put it in an angled vice mm -hmm. All right, take your three axis machine in, I'll, and I'll put it in from the side, you know, and we're still able to take advantage of that. Again, the part has to allow it, right? So if you're trying to go around an edge, you know, unfortunately, you know, that's not going to work as well, but you probably need a four or five axis machine anyway, if you're going to go all the way around the part. Right, right. But it is something you can do and something that you uh, should keep in mind um, to, to do anytime you can. Yes, you know, I see a lot of um, three-axis machining where they don't utilize all the cutting gauges because of that. But if they just, like you said, a little bit smarter with their fixed string, orient the part where they can uh, engage those other teeth, it's great. Mm -hmm. Get it off the center line. And right. tool life goes much it, better. It it's does. Much, it much, does. Much, much better. I'm going to switch cameras back real quick. All right. So let's think about this, Danny. So, so what we're seeing, right, is we're seeing that, you know, we've got this, this little model here. You know, we've talked about the effect of step over with a certain size ball, right. what that does to cusp pipe. Um, but maybe there's some other ways that I can sort of exploit this. I mean, we know this is a geometrical relationship, mm -hmm. right? So one factor would be step over, but 
what are some other things that we can do um, to get a uh, acceptable cusp height, but maybe be able to take bigger cuts, bigger step overs? Yeah, so, you know, we talked about a little bit earlier about making the radius as large as we can, but sometimes um, the radius can't be larger, not because of the part shape as far as the radius in it, but maybe because of clearance issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, we're going to hit a shoulder or whatever. So we have to have a smaller diameter cutter. So what we can do is we can put a, a larger radius on the cutter instead of say like a maybe a half inch ball nose that has a, a quarter inch radius. We can right. use a half inch tool with maybe a half inch radius on mm -hmm. it. Uh, we can do that with a, a larger radius on the bottom or we can do it with what we call barrel cutters. Mm -hmm. uh, where we'll have a radius on the side or tapered barrel cutters. Um, we do all those as, as custom here at Kennel Metal. We've done it for quite some time. And we help customers with, with how to program it, how to get the finishes that they want. But that's a really good way of doing it. And also, when you go to barrel cutters mm -hmm. or taper barrel cutters, or when you uh, change those radiuses, you can usually in increase the flute count as well because right. it's more open the, the way you position it. So there's uh, lots of things to take in, a, in, a, uh, in consideration on maximizing your performance. And, uh, but uh, definitely, if anytime you can increase that radius, then you're better off. Now, mm -hmm. There's sometimes that we can't um, we can't use uh, a larger radius, um, but maybe we can use a standard end mill if we have these additional axes on our machine. If we have a four or five axis machine. Mm -hmm. We can take a corner radius end mill and use that. And I think that's that's a good, uh, a good that's thing a good to point. talk about today. Yep. That's a good point. So let's maybe you know give a little demonstration of how that could work. And um, yeah, call it. Apologize, we're switching back and forth here a little bit with the with the camera, but we're trying to keep these as, as visual as we can make them. So I'm going to switch cameras again real quick. Okay, so to kind of help illustrate this idea of using a, a corner radius tool instead, the visual that we kind of want, want to show here is... You know, if we take a, let's say we take a ball nose, you know, we know what the radius is. Right. It really doesn't matter how we tilt it. We're stuck with that radius, right? We talked about the high feed cutters. We'll maybe talk about those in a little bit more detail, but we've got several series, both of solid tools and indexable tools that have that large nose radius to take advantage of it. Um, but here to kind of show what would happen with a corner radius tool, we'll take our, our little block here again. All right, and I just have a simple ring. So I just want to kind of show this. If this ring represents um, looking at the end. Let's of, just say it's a one-inch diameter tool. tool. So yeah. Let's say it's one-inch diameter so that's tool, a half right? inch radius. So right? I got a half-inch radius. But as I start to tilt that, you can see how much flatter this radius down here appears. Of course, if I go all the way to 90 degrees, we're perfectly flat. We're perfectly flat. That, of course, this is representing the end of the tool. So here it's perfectly flat, working on the end face. Here it's working on the outer diameter. Here it's somewhere in between, but you can see how you can use that tilt on a corner radius tool yes. to get overall a projected larger surface. Yeah, and I've got that also illustrated in our presentation, too. I'll pull it up. So let me switch this, cameras back. Right, right yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So in the, the diagram that we have pulled up here, this is basically showing what Steve showed, but uh, you can see here that we have a corner radius end mill with a forward lean or forward tilt, however you want to describe it, that's represented in T here. Mm -hmm. All right, this tool has a corner radius on it, so we're leaning it forward. But this MR that you see here is the manufacturing radius, basically, or basically what the minimum radius would be uh, for a part. So right. I'm thinking about maybe like an airfoil. Yeah. And you have an airfoil. Envision a curve. A, yeah. yeah. Envision an internal curve. Right. That your tool has got to work. Come in. Right. We can't heal out on the backside. Yes. And then you see to the right, basically with this same tilt, this was, you know, um, uh, just sketched, uh, I sketched this up yesterday, but when you lean it forward, you can see how we get an ellipse, okay, of that shape, and the more we tilt it forward, uh, the smaller that radius gets. The more we tilt it back and make it more and more vertical, 
mm-hmm. you know, flatter it in. Like just like Steve showed us, you know, at 90 degrees it would be at right. five hours, zero degrees, however you want to look at it. Uh, it would be exactly flat. So, but you, you can't always keep it as close to flat because you see here in the sketch, it, the backside will heal out depending on what that part is. Mm-hmm. So uh, what the part shape is. So we have to forward it, lean it enough to where we don't heal out on the backside and still be able to um, get our best performance out of the cutter. Absolutely. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit. You know, we briefly mentioned the high feed cutters. Um, and uh, so let's jump over. We'll talk a little bit about our uh, you know, introduce this idea of what the high feed cutters are. Make sure that we've we've got that clear. Um, while we're pulling that up, I'm just going to hit. I'll pick a question. We'll get some more later. I see that um, Tom was asking about: Is it also effective to tilt on uh, Swiss machines with live tools using a ball nose when machining the sphere on on the face of a part? Um, and yeah, so so let's just make sure we kind of envision it. We've got a sphere coming out, right? Mm-hmm. And we're working around that. So, of course, once you move off of the center from your ball nose to the sphere, you're essentially going to use three axes even just gives you that freedom that you're moving around. But when you get to the center, um, you know, absolutely, it would make sense to, to use a tilt because when you get center to center, um, you're going to be just sort of plowing with the tip of the end mill right, right in the very center. Um, it does give you a good chance once you move around um, that, that you're automatically getting that tilt, but in the center it would help. So, all right, and those are some very good pictures that Danny just brought up uh, about some of our of our tools. So, uh, on the on the Kenna Metal brand, we've got uh, Kenfeed tools. We've got a couple series of Kenfeed. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got some as solids, some as modulars. Um, also for titanium. Also for steel. titanium. So there's there's two ranges for two different hardnesses of steels, and then one for titanium. And then in the indexable series, we've got the 7792, which is you know the same type of concept that we're going to talk about here, but of course an indexable tool, and um, that will you know help you in in a lot of ways. One of the things, too, just to kind of mention, uh, let Danny talk a little bit here about how the forces work, that I will say is that, especially in harder steels, mm-hmm. uh, we see a lot of people actually replacing some of their grinding operations with the Ken feed tools um, because you can generate a very smooth very finish smooth. Very nice finish. Um, and do it uh, quite effectively. Um, the other thing is when we get into the solid tools, so we, we've got a patented design on our Kenfeed tools. Um, and kind of like we've talked about with, with TE and some other tools, how we have a twist or curve to the end face, uh, that's also on our Kenfeed tools. And that really helps with finish as well. So it kind of helps kind of pushing out along and keeping that cut moving um, to make sure that the feed lines that we would get uh, it also helps there to kind of doubly help you with that surface finish. Yeah, you know, one of the nice things about using the, the uh, high feed mills, whether it be a solid or the indexable, is, you know, you mentioned it while ago about the forces. The forces do change. Mm-hmm. They're not the same as they would be with a typical um, milling operation in the fact that the forces are going much more up the spindle instead of a radial force. And now what does that do for us? That helps us for whenever we have these deep pockets or long reach situations where we have to get down into a part and maybe uh, there's something in the way that, and that's, that's not let us you know, move the spindle into the part mm-hmm. and we have to reach in there with maybe uh, uh, an extension or whatever we have and we're reaching down deep into the part like that, um, these high feed mills don't mind that as much right. because the forces are going up the spindle so you don't get the radial uh, deflection that you would get uh, with typical milling, so that's the nice thing about uh, these type of cutters. They don't; they tend to work well in long reach applications. Mm-hmm. Uh, not to mention that they're just great tools as far as um, you know, giving us a high metal removal rate, right? Uh, and uh, also, you know, great finishes like you just talked about. Now, one thing I forgot to mention too, before we get too far into the high uh, high feed cutters, Steve, is uh, the advantages of the of the radius when we're doing coloring. And I, I did have this one illustration here I wanted to bring up right quick. 
this is a, a paper that I did for a customer where they were uh, machining a part uh, and they were doing it on a three axis machine. Mm -hmm. uh, so we worked with them to, to re uh, redo their tech, uh, their uh, fixturing. So they put the part on a taper so they could utilize the, the tool off the center line. They were using a two foot ball nose uh, originally. And the reason why they're using two foot ball nose is because what we talked about earlier, they were cutting over center a lot. Mm -hmm. So adding more additional cutting edges really didn't help them any because they weren't being effective. You know, they were they were outside that, that diameter that we talked about earlier. But when we fixtured the part uh, where they could utilize more teeth, then we, we ended up going to a four foot tool. But you see here to the, to the right, the top right, this is basically what their, their situation before. And this was a, uh, medical part, and this is the reason why the cusp height is so low, and it's what they had programmed in. But they were basically running um, at uh, 1300 RPM or 13,000, sorry, and uh, they were running at a 10,000 uh, depth of cut or AP, and they had a, um, a, a very small cusp pipe. But if you look at all these illustrations here, they're all the cusp pipe's the same, the RPMs are the same, and uh, the AP is the same. But as we increase the radius, and you see these diagrams we have above, uh, this shows their effective cutting diameter was 144,000 and 8 tenths. I'm not sure if you guys can read that or not. Uh, and it, it shows that we have a, a ball nose uh, radius, which would be half of the diameter. But on this uh, custom tool that we made, which we would call a, a bull nose, is what we normally call it for us, but it, it's a larger radius than what uh, half of the di diameter is. So we went from a 156 to a 250 radius. Uh, and you see the advantage it gave us, but adding the additional fluke also gave us an, an advantage. So I just gave them all this as, as an option whenever we were um, demonstrating this for them. Uh, then the third option was an even larger radius where we went up to a 375. And you see that as we went up in the radius to maintain the same cusp pipe, our step over increased. Mm -hmm. So before, at the very beginning, we were at 3,005 tenths step over. Uh, but when we went to a larger radius, we went to four and four tenths, and then when we went even larger radius, we went to five and uh, five thousand four tenths. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're talking about you know really doing a lot of passes it, on a part, it can it can add, uh, decrease your cycle time quite a bit. Right. Um, we had a question come in real quick, Danny, mm -hmm. pertaining to this: if the thirteen thousand RPM was fixed or a maximum. And that was that was fixed in it all was, these paths. Yeah, it was, it was the maximum of the mach uh, yeah. particular machine we had. Yeah, so it was it was both. It was the maximum for the machine and, and fixed yeah. throughout the path. That's correct. Um, it does bring up a good point, and um, you know, one thing to think about if you're out there getting ready to buy a machine, mm -hmm. and you're especially looking at four and five axes um, machining, is that you know typically you're going to you're going to want to think about spindle speed a little bit because. Mm -hmm. If the primary purpose is to do this type of work, then you know we're going to talk a little bit more. We talked in the last webinar about how to adjust the speed as you go around the ball. So we talked about zero speed, and as you're closer in, how you need to increase the the RPM to uh, to account for that. Um, so you know it's just something to keep in mind that you know we're not talking um, you know extremely high speed, but it's going to depend on the material, you know, so obviously, yeah, if we jump into aluminum or something, then definitely you're, you're already looking at wanting more RPMs oh, yeah. and definitely even more, but, but even for titanium work, steel work, stuff like that, um, you know, oftentimes we're recommending, you know, six, 8,000, 8,000 plus RPM range. So, uh, again, you know, may not have to be a 30,000, RPM machine, but um, at least maybe maybe twelve if you're not doing aluminum is something that you know you want to think about. So now, if I remember correctly on this customer, it's been a while, but I think he actually had capability to go up to fifteen thousand RPMs, mm -hmm. but he was only comfortable at running at thirteen thousand gotcha. because he didn't want to keep, he didn't want to run at the maximum uh, in continuous production. So that, this was the number that they gave to us. Okay, they felt was their comfortable max rpm so mm -hmm. that's pretty much what we but it is a great question because yes. it's, and normally that would have changed as our effect of cutting diameter would have changed so it's a great question very good so now i guess we can go ahead and get into the kin feed if you want to i'm sorry yeah. I, I just want to make sure we got that point in before no i before think that was good danny because 
it, it directly shows how changing the shape is going to affect it. And so that's the whole, you know, one of the first ideas just behind either the Ken feed or the indexable um, is simply the fact that, you know, we're going to change that shape. It's going to let us take a bigger step over. Um, the next part of that is it's also going to change the forces. So you mentioned it earlier, but, you know, you got to remember a little bit about when we look at the flexion of a tool, and I know there are a couple questions coming in about the flexion of the tool. I'm just going to answer it this way for right now. You always have to think about, you know, when we when we think about bending moment, you know, a lot of times we're thinking of how much the tool is stuck out from the spindle, and and that's true. But you have to think of the di the the direction of the forces. So you know that's true when your forces are radial. OK, um, but when you start to move that force more in the axial direction, then our our distance um, that we're going to factor in vector wise starts to change. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the really cool things that kind of is illustrated in this picture. Again, is more how much we start to push those forces vertically up along the axis of the tool where it is extremely stiff and the machine's extremely stiff. So. There was another question here. I see that uh, somebody's asking if there's a table recommended for step overs for a certain surface quality. And you know, we have some, uh, but I, I, you can Google it mm -hmm. uh, on the internet, and there's lots of different web pages I've seen yep. over the years that um, that you can type in step over versus surface finish and step over versus uh, the ball uh, the radius, mm -hmm. and it'll tell you for a specific cusp height how far, how much you can step over. Uh, and so I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a little formula um, in our Facebook page yep. uh, where this is going. I'll drop that in the comments. We'll try to remember to drop it in the YouTube as well. Um, we've got a question. I'll just hit it now with uh, coming from Ryan uh, about, you know, this being said, talking about indexable high feed mills being applicable for CNC machines that have multiple strokes on one machine part. Yeah, definitely think about part size. So, um, you know, a lot of, it's not a hard and fast rule of when you're going to pick a solid and when you're going to pick an indexable, but certainly that's one of the first things that we start to think about is, is let's say the size of our indexable cutters that we're going to offer. And, um, you know, yes, if it's the right situation, you know, as far as um, the grade of that, that tool for the material you're working with, all that type of stuff, and you're, it's a bigger area. Uh, then the indexable certainly could make sense. Um, you know, the solid tools uh, give you some, a little bit of accuracy advantage, I would say, a little bit less deflection, um, really good in very hard steels uh, with the geometries we have available. Yes. Um, you know, those would be more their positives. Um, bigger areas, definitely the, the indexable would start to kick in. Um, so, okay, so Ryan asked a follow up there real quick. Reason for asking that was trying to erase the stroke marks and improve the overall surface finish of the part. So, definitely the size of the radius that we're talking about here, that end form radius, is going to, um, that's going to be one of your biggest factors along with the step over um, to get that surface finish based on cusp height. Right. So, so, yes, if you can pick a tool with a bigger radius, um, and of course a bigger indexable or, or, you know, if you're working in solids, bigger solid, we're going to offer a bigger radius. Um, then, uh, yes, that can definitely help you. You're, you're taking advantage of geometry. I think that's, that's probably, we could have renamed this series, how to manipulate geometry to your advantage. Um, and that's a lot of what we're trying to help people understand how to do here is how to make good decisions, uh, about, you know, using just the, the benefit of, of basic geometry to help you run faster and get better finishes. So I think we need to talk a little bit about how to program these high feed cutters whenever we're in programming in our uh, CAM software. Now, mm -hmm. I know that, um, you know, uh, an easy way of doing that is what we have illustrated here to the right is that basically you can just treat this like a corn radius end mill in your software. Uh, and we have an RT value that you'll see in our catalogs, and, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in Novo as well, that we can pull out that RT value. But uh, basically, you treat it like a corner radius and the, the CAM software will, um, will deal, 
able to calculate the tool pass correctly. Uh, but it, if you want to make it absolutely accurate, uh, it's better to put in the, the correct form of that. Yes, uh, that cutter. So we have that information uh, in, in, over here to the left. You see all these different dimensions um, pointed out here. We have that in our catalogs. But the nice thing, and this is what you and I were talking about, Steve, uh, just a few minutes ago, is that you know we talked about Novo in one of our previous webinars. The nice thing is we can pull that model out of Novo, and it already mm -hmm. has the correct radius on it. And, and you can just interject that right into your CAM software and uh, be able to go you know, right to programming and not have any issues. So, but it, but you know, if you don't have uh, Novo and uh, maybe your shop doesn't allow it, you have mm -hmm. cloud-based software or something, and you can't get to it, you can easily do it by just using the RT value and just calculating right. as a, a point rate in CAM. So just thought I'd throw that in. So and you can find all the get, catalogs on our website, right. um, information. So this is definitely important. and. Um, something that you want to keep in mind so um, all right so that's a little bit about how to cam program it oh I, I really like so we've got it got an example here uh, to go into so Danny why don't you talk us through this a little bit yeah this is not actually a, a, a 3d surface but uh, it just shows the advantages of, of uh, being able to use a, a, a high feed meal or this is at, actually is one of our 10 feet um, meals where we actually can increase the metal removal rate by mm -hmm. the chip thinning properties that it gives you. And this just shows you that um, uh, in this example, we were uh, machining P20 at 52 Rockwell. And the, the cool thing here is to look at uh, the FZ or the feed per two. Yep. Uh, we were running this tool at nearly 20,000 feet per two. Uh, again, this is a, uh, a, a six fluid end mill. Uh, a lot of our com competitors' end mills are just four. Right. Uh, so it gives us, you know, a pretty big advantage on me total metal removal rate. But at 20,000 feet per tube, this is just some of the uh, possibilities that you can, you can get with this cutter. So just keep yeah. that in mind. And it also works that well in, in surfacing as well. Right. And, and just a comment. So, so part one, we talked more about the math of the chip thinning. This part, we're talking more about the shape and the surfaces um, and surface finish. But kind of back to that part part one where we talk about you know using um, calculations for chip thinning this is again where we're taking a huge advantage of that shape so we're acting like the cutter is a much bigger tool than it is by putting that big radius on the end so essentially it seems like we're dealing with a very very low axial depth of cut or very low radial depth of cut um, and um, in this case, it's it's axial, but just kind of have that image in your mind from the first uh, from the first webinar, and and that's how we're able to have just these crazy feed per tooth. Uh, the, the feed per tooth is extremely high. And we have somebody asking if um, if they could get a copy of or a recording of mm -hmm. this presentation. Uh, this all this will be on Facebook, so yes. you can go back and reference this anytime you want uh, in in the in the future. I think we will also have it on YouTube as well, so. Uh, just anytime you want to go back and reference it, it will be available on Facebook. Right. Yep. And um, and we're putting all this stuff on YouTube as well. And uh, so you'll be able to check that uh, very soon. Um, get another question about the surface roughness. So I, I will drop that in the Facebook comments. And I'll also try to drop that in the, in the YouTube um, comments as well, an equation for that. Um but I, I think that's also pretty pretty easy to find as well. While we're talking about questions, I know in our last webinar on chip cleaning, there was a, uh, an individual, uh, I think it was JC, that was asking us uh, a question that I think would be good for us to bring up mm -hmm. today. Um, and maybe you could help us with, with answering it, Steve. But you know, first off, JC wanted to thank us for the, the last webinar, and, and uh, he said it was really informative for him. But he... He wanted to uh, suggest a question. He's, he says, is it possible to talk or to, for us to show a bit more about how you measure the temperature, the tool load, and all that? And he says, he didn't ask if big machine shops do that uh, type of measurements in-house to improve their productivity, or do they usually ask us mm -hmm. to, you know, where to go and, and how to help, help them out with that? So uh, maybe you could illustrate. I know okay. we talked a little bit yeah. about this before, but maybe you could show how we measure that in our lab and uh, use that for, for um, uh, designing our cutters. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to, uh, to answer that a little bit. 
Um, and thank you for the question. Yes. So I'll, I'll answer a little bit about some of the technology we use, and then we'll also talk about the, the shops. So I would say it definitely varies based on the size of the manufacturer, how much in-house research they do. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's probably just a handful of manufacturers that we work with that have some of the measurement that we have internally. There's a few um, that do, um, but most people are going to handle it in a few different ways, and we'll try to talk about those. So I'm going to start off a little bit with force measurement because I'm sure it is interesting for people, you know, how do we go about um, studying our processes and, and what we're doing with our tools? So the first thing I'm going to show um, is this is a is a is a, one of our older uh, force dynamometers that we would put in one of our machining centers for testing. So um, I, I chose this when we have uh, quite a lot of these, but. I, I, the newer ones are a single port. I chose this older one because you can see these four ports or four channels here. So the technology behind this is this is using uh, piezoelectric quartz plates um, that are oriented in different ways. So the grain structure of the, of the quartz is oriented so that we can measure uh, basically the four channels. One is going to be a thrust force, so directly in. One is torque. Uh, and then we have X and Y forces. And so that's that's the four channels that we have here. So um, there's a lot of different designs of, of these. So we have these that we use a lot more for um, drills and taps. Um, we have milling versions of these where this is a big plate. Uh, so same thing, we'd have torque, we'd have thrust. Um, torque comes a little bit more in a little different way on the milling plates because we're kind of looking more at X, Y forces in the location, um, but, uh, but still possible. So this is a very, very, very sensitive way. And just to kind of uh, illustrate how this is used, this is a very sensitive way to exactly measure cutting forces. Now, the way these work is these would be mounted uh, on the bed of the machine, then we'll build a fixture to hold a workpiece. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually measuring the forces as they're applied to the workpiece. So if it's a drill or tap, we're going to go right in the center of this thing, pick up the forces. Um, again, the milling ones, you know, it's more a big, big plate. We're going to put our workpiece on there and, and go to town. Um, we will hook these up to a charge amplifier. That charge amplifier will take care of adding the charge to the plates give us a signal back, we pick up with a high-speed data collection system, and we record all those forces. And we use these all the time uh, in our testing to help us compare different geometries, uh, different types of tools, different types of cuts, characterize different materials. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really in a lot so of ways. So that's the forces, how do. it relates to the part. Yes. So can we, can we measure the forces, how they relate to the tool? Yes. So two ways we can do that. So, so one, obviously, we know what we're seeing on the part. We can look back in mm -hmm. terms of the tool. Uh, another way we can do it is to take a dynamometer that's a rotating dynamometer attached to the spindle itself. Um, those could be fixed in the machine. Um, or we could use different systems that have a tool holder with a set of strain gauges. Um, and these are really cool. So... Um, if you want to see torque, if you want to see thrust, if you want to see bending moment, basically you're measuring what's happening to the holder itself. In this case, this is a hydraulic holder here. So you're measuring what's happening there. And uh, some of the things, uh, examples that we've given in some of the last webinars, uh, we actually use this type of system um, to gather and measure the forces. So those are the two, two or three high level ways that we do this. When we get into to turning, so we have turning dyna dynamometers, those will be mounted more on a tool post uh, to measure those forces. And, um, you know, that's that's definitely stuff we do. On top of that, um, so with these high-speed data collection systems, we've got accelerometers. You know, we can measure vibration while we're doing it. Uh, a lot of different types of types of things. So, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it's fun for us because when we do this, we do a lot of simulations, but we also do, 
you know, along with that, we're, we're cutting real chips. We're measuring everything we possibly can and uh, using that to help us make, make good decisions. Um, the other part of the question, well, let me finish with forces for a second. Right. Um, because, um, and we have uh, somebody commenting about, uh, about third wave systems um, and other types of, uh, yeah, FEA, and certainly we use that. So we have several different um, FEA packages, and if you check, you can find some some white papers written and published by us, even even using that software and some other ones yes. as well. Um, we we like to tie all that together. But let's say for those of you out there that are don't want to spend, I, I've got some machining centers that literally have more money tied up in measuring systems attached to the machine than the machining center is worth. So most of you are not going to want to be there. Okay, but where you can be is, um, you know, certainly starting with just simple spindle power, you know, paying attention, making some experiments where you look at the spindle load of your machine. Um, if you are running a long job and you want to make a comparison, obviously you may not want to stand there. If, if we're at customers, we've stuck GoPros in front of them and go back and look at the data. Um, we've, we've been interested in, a certain section of the part got there and and watched it you know recorded it in slow motion so we could go back and look at certain parts of it that, that were a little bit more intense the next level of that is to find a way to capture that so newer machines oftentimes that data um, is being captured and being logged in a lot of the newer controls so you can talk to your machine builder about that um, the other part of that would be if you want to capture it yourself, and, and we do this internally and have done this at the customers, um, you can get uh, load systems to measure the, the, let's say, electrical load going to the spindle. Same thing that your spindle load meter is looking at and hook it up to a data acquisition system. Record it. You need to figure out, let's say, what frequency you want to record that at, you know, whether you've got a lot of data um, or, you know, are you looking very intently at a short period of the cycle where you want to sample rather quickly, or do you have a fairly stable load over a long cycle where you could use more of a data logger to kind of look at that. Um, temperature wise is, is a little different. So uh, we do have thermal cameras, we have um, that stuff in our, in our labs to play with, and we do use that. Now, one of the things to think about with a thermal camera is that you're looking a little bit more at residual temperature. So make the cut, look at it right afterwards, look at it going in, look at it going out. Um, certainly can tell you, a, you know, a, a way to judge it. If you want to get right to point of contact, um, certainly, and that's where FEA these days really, really helps you. Yeah. Um, but when you want to do it, there's some, some excellent work and papers out there using embedded thermocouples and things like that, uh, even some cool stuff that uh, involves, um, let's say, metallography at the, at the same time. So that's probably a little bit more than we have time to talk about today, but hopefully that gives you some idea of some of the tools, some of the equipment that we use um, here at Kenametal to help design our tools and test our tools. Um, and again, we have, we have quite a lot of it and, and we use it. Um, and then also how we put that together so that when we share things with you, um, that you know you know that these are these are parameters that we've tested that we've looked into, and, and again, kind of how we compare um, you know different different types of materials. Um, one last thing, and we're close to being out of time. We'll just talk real quickly. We also had another question related to the increasing spindle speed when we had a lower radial depth of cut, so a lower engagement angle. Um, I don't know if, Danny, maybe you want to bring up, a, do we have a slide showing that um, distance in the cut, arc of engagement versus out? Um, or do you see yeah, another question? I'm, I'm sure I do. Okay. okay. Let's see. Um, so while we get, let's just, Talk about that for for a moment, and this is kind of going back to the idea. Um, we can use that. That's perfect. That help? that that will help just fine. So let me turn my pointer on for just a second here. Um, 
get my pointer off the screen. Okay. So here we've got two different arc angles of engagement. And we can kind of think about this in terms of when we're talking about peel milling or we're talking about taking advantage of a low radial depth of cut and going more high velocity style. So the high velocity style, a lot of times we think about it in terms of increased feed rate, but we talked about it before a little bit in the last webinar, I think that you can increase your cutting speed as well when you decrease that angle of engagement. And a lot of people, you know, would, would like to know why. And, and uh, I'll try to answer this fairly quickly, but also scientifically. So that angle of engagement is really, really important because when we think about it, we're going to set the top end cutting speed of our tools and recommendations based on what that grade, in other words, coating plus substrate together, no, what's the maximum temperatures that it can handle. So feed is a little bit more geometry dependent. Um, geometry can affect the speed if it influences temperature, but again, temperature and cutting speed go directly together. We're trying to keep that tool from, uh, you know, what we'd say in the South, burning up, right? So um, we want to we want to control that. So let's think about this a little bit. If I was going to make an equivalent cut, so a lot of times when we get in high high velocity uh, cuts, we might be a lower metal removal rate, just depending on what you want to do. But let's say that you're maximizing it out, you're maximizing the spindle of that machine, and you've got these two cuts. Let's say that they were making an equivalent metal removal rate, so a lower depth of cut here but we have sped it up. And let's just envision that this isn't really a corner, but this is this is making a deep radial depth of cut. Right, 70% engagement. Yes. So. so what's going to happen is that cut is going to generate a certain amount of forces, okay? Those forces over time is a certain amount of power. Roughly 90%-ish of that power is going to get converted to heat, and it's got to go somewhere. Um, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more the next time, expand on it, but what I want you to think about a little bit is that power, there's something that we call um, heat flux, and heat flux is a measure of that energy in watts over an area, usually, you know, in square meters. So when we change from a short depth of cut, all right, to a very long depth of cut in this situation on the left, left because again, when we drop that AE, we can extend the AP, we can right. extend the axial and depth we of cut. Spread it out, yeah. So what happens is, is we will take the same amount of thermal energy, we'll spread it over a much bigger area, okay? And that effect is going to overall lower the temperature at the point of cut significantly. So we'll take advantage of that and speed the tool back up. So if you're looking in Novo, or if you're talking to us about recommendations, you know, and we and you see that that relationship where we start to change it based on depth of cut, um, that's that's why. So one one just maybe final point on that uh, is an example would be a hair dryer. Yeah. You know, if you take an 1800 watt hair dryer or something like that, you know, if you're if you're waving it up and down, you know, on your arm, whatever, you're you're not likely to feel a lot of heat compared to if you set it on your hand and, and, just and leave it there, right? We've got the same amount of heat flux, the same amount of energy going in, but we change the area. Yeah, I think we definitely need to talk about this more, Steve. Yep. I think maybe in the next one we get into pocketing and stuff, this mm -hmm. will be a really good uh, uh, topic that we can t continue to let's, uh, let's discuss do that more. So we'll, we'll table that for now yep. and, and, and make that in our next one, but it's a very good point, and I think it's something that we de definitely need to talk about some more and put a little bit more detail to Absolutely. It. But I think we're running out of time, so I think with that, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, say goodbye, and uh, until next time, guys. Yeah, thank you all for your questions. Hope you enjoy it. Again, please check it out. Give us uh, a like. Give us some comments on, on Facebook and YouTube, and we will see you next time. Take see care. See you, guys. Bye.